until the end of his sophomore year in June 2004, Mark Zuckerberg ran Facebook out of a college dorm room at Harvard University. He relocated the company to Palo Alto, California, and in June of 2005, Facebook reached a milestone of 3 million users, and Mark and his team of 20 employees celebrated with a keg of Heineken. In less than 10 years, the company would pretty much succeed in their mission to connect the world. As of 2018, the company had 2.8 billion users across the globe, and the company has been under increased scrutiny for the numerous privacy violations and accusations of not doing enough to stop countries and bad actors from weaponizing the platform. In this episode, we will take a closer and frightening look at the darker side of social media, the alarms that are ringing today, and how warfare may very well have been disrupted by bringing the front line into your homes, your phones, and your news feeds. Technology, when used by the righteous, is good for the righteous and good for the world. When used by the wicked, it's bad for the wicked and bad for the world. To understand how disruption happens, we turn to Professor Clayton Christensen of Harvard Business School. Professor Christensen authored The Innovator's Dilemma, which is a study of the principles of disruption which can be applied to any industry. As we'll see later on, Professor Christensen was summoned by the Secretary of Defense of the United States during the Clinton administration to help prepare against terrorism in 1999, prior to 9-11. In the pursuit of profit, generation after generation, companies and industries make better and better and better products. And what the theory says is if you think you can win by introducing a better product that you could sell for better profits to the best customers of the leader in the industry, they will always kill you. But if instead, if you come in at the bottom of a market and introduce products that actually aren't as good as what the leaders are making, and then keep moving up from the bottom, it's situate in the pursuit of profit, the leading industry will flee up market rather than fight you. And therefore, if you want to be sure that you kill the competitor rather than competitors kill you, you should always go to the bottom of the market like you're a young boy and you can kill the giant because the giant is motivated to flee rather than what fight. Social media has clearly disrupted a number of industries with arguably the most pronounced being media and marketing. Content has become king. Professor Jonah Berger of the Wharton School explains. So in a contagious world, I think we'll see fewer advertisements and more interpersonal communication. Less money spent on how can we interrupt consumers from you know, their television show or their favorite radio program and shove an ad in their face so they'll pay attention to us. And more, well, how can we get their friends to tell them about this product? 7% of word of mouth is online. Not 70, not 17, 7. Much smaller than we think. Professor Berger wrote Contagious, the book explaining why things go viral. When it comes to the polarization of populations through social media, emotion plays a key role in causing word of mouth to spread. And so what we found is the answer is not just about positive or negative. We share positive things and we avoid sharing negative ones. But it's really about the arousal or activation that emotion evokes. If we think about anger versus sadness, for example. Well, on the positive side, things like excitement or amusement drive people to talk and share. They activate people, they activate them to take an action, and one of those actions is, is sharing. Digital content that incites anger and hatred is conducive to virility. This type of content often manifests in the form of bigotry and disinformation. We oftentimes see people sharing content that they don't like and bemoan the injustice. Or trolls purposely drawing people into heated debates online, which the algorithms generously reward the increased engagement on the platform by showing the content in more news feeds. The more time that is spent and engagement that happens on social media platforms, the more money corporations make. It used to be that the New York Times had a cost of page, which limited the number of pages they would produce. In the digital age, adding another link is practically free, which enables more money to be spent on quality journalism. But what if emotional articles create more social media engagement than informative articles? What if the system is rigged to reward engagement, such as comments and likes and mad faces, with more appearances in more news feeds? A person in the 1990s who didn't like an article by the New York Times would never purchase 1,000 papers and hand them out to their friends. But in a digital age, that is effectively what they're doing when they share articles they don't approve of. Both the media companies and the social media companies benefit financially from the more emotional posts, often at the cost of accuracy. But is it limited to business? Or perhaps governments and bad actors could successfully weaponize these platforms. Facebook, 
a kind of digital nation state with more than two billion citizens across the geographical nation's borders, has been at the forefront of going viral, as well as the scrutiny of the public eye, both in the news and in government. Frontline, an investigative reporting branch of PBS, recently released a groundbreaking documentary on Facebook entitled The Facebook Dilemma. The documentary sheds light on Facebook from insider employees, both current and prior. It also gives us a picture of how the platform can be used for both good and bad actors. The United States Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, DARPA, for six years it's held to a singular mission to make pivotal investments in breakthrough technologies for national security. Rand Waltzman was project manager at DARPA from 2012 to 2015. According to Frontline, Waltzman and his team published more than 200 academic papers and reports about the threats they were seeing from social media. One major threat is the weaponization of Facebook. What I saw over the years of the program was that the medium enables you to really take disinformation and turn it into a serious weapon. For example, when you see people forming into communities, okay, to what's called filter bubbles. Now I'm going to exploit that to craft my message so that it resonates most exactly with that community. And I'll do that for every single community. It would be pretty easy, it would be pretty easy to set up a fake account, or a large number of fake accounts, embedded in different communities, and use them to disseminate propaganda. That's why it's a serious weapon, because it's at an enormous scale. It's the scale that makes it a weapon. When the Arab Spring broke out in Egypt, it was Facebook that was lauded as a main catalyst. Wael Gahonim created the Facebook event that ultimately went viral and led to the Arab Spring and the revolution in Egypt. And I just posted an event calling for a revolution uh, in 10 days. Like, we should all get to the street and we should all bring down Mubarak. Organized by a group of online activists. We're calling it the Facebook revolution. I would not have been able to propagate my ideas to others without social media, without Facebook. It was that same technology, however, that caused chaos and disruption, eventually leading to the Muslim Brotherhood taking over. All these voices started to clash, and the environment on social media breathed that kind of clash, like that polarization rewarded it. If you increase the tone of your posts against uh, your opponents, you're going to get more distribution. Because we tend to be more tribal, so if I call my opponents names, my tribe is happy and celebrating. Yes, do it. Like, comment, share. So more people end up seeing it because the algorithm is going to say, oh, okay, that's engaging content. People like it. Show it to more people. The Russian government used Facebook as a weapon to sow fear and internal conflict among the Ukrainian citizens. Frontline reports. What is the Internet Research Agency? Well, it's a company that creates a fake perception of Russia. They use things like illustrations, pictures, anything that would influence people's minds. When I worked there, I didn't hear anyone say, the government runs us or the Kremlin runs us, but everyone there knew, and everyone realized it. Was the main intention to make the Ukrainian government look bad? Yeah, yeah, that's what it was. This was the intention with Ukraine. Put President Poroshenko in a bad light, and the rest of the government and the military, and so on. You come to work, and there's a pile of SIM cards, many, many SIM cards, and an old mobile phone. You need an account to register for various social media sites. You pick a photo of a random person, choose a random last name, and start posting links to news in different groups. According to New York Times correspondent Adam Ellick, the disinformation game, a.k.a. fake news, used for warfare is nothing new. OK, so to start, let's go back to July 1983 and all the way over here, New Delhi, India. This is when a remarkable story appears in a newspaper called The Patriot. It claims the HIV virus was secretly created by US government scientists as a weapon to kill African Americans and gay people. It even names a facility, Fort Detrick in Maryland, where the virus was supposed to have been concocted. It's a crazy allegation printed in a small newspaper. No big deal, right? But fast forward just a couple of years and look what's happening. The story is spreading all over Africa. A scientific report's even published by two East German biologists who say they can prove AIDS is made in the USA. 
All these articles are from just a few months at the end of 1986. And then somehow, it ends up here. A Soviet military publication claims the virus that causes AIDS leaked from a US Army laboratory. So let me introduce you to a few authentic grifters. Stashed away on some old videotapes, we found interviews with a bunch of ex-spies. This guy, Ladislav Bittman, this guy, Stanislav Levchenko, and this guy, Yuri Bezminov. They all worked for the KGB during the Cold War before defecting to the US, and it's thanks to them that we know so much about one of the KGB's most secretive department. At least 15,000 people who, in the Soviet Union and outside of the Soviet Union, are involved in that kind of actions on regular and daily basis. You heard that right, 15,000 people. That's more than the entire staff at the State Department after 9-11. Okay, so disinformation warfare is nothing new, but the medium in which it spreads is. Did Facebook understand what was going on? Did they care? Tim Sparapani was Facebook's director of public policy from 2009 to 2011. He appeared on this Frontline documentary and explains. I think some of us had an early understanding that we were creating, in some ways, a digital nation state. I think no one at any of these companies in Silicon Valley has the resources for this kind of scale. Clicking yes, no, keep, take down, take down, take down, keep up, keep up. And making judgment calls, snap judgment calls about does it violate our terms of service? Does it violate our standards of decency? What are the consequences of the speech? So you have this fabulously talented group of mostly 20-somethings who are deciding what speech matters. And they're doing it in real time, all day, every day. The company was trying to make money. It was trying to keep costs down. Uh, it had to be a, a, a going concern. It had to be a, a revenue-generating thing or it would cease to exist. So Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is the provision which allows the internet economy to grow and thrive. And Facebook is one of the principal beneficiaries of this provision. It says, don't hold this internet company responsible if some idiot says something violent on the site. Um, don't hold the internet company responsible if somebody publishes something uh, that creates conflict, uh, that, that violates the law. It's the quintessential provision that allows them to say, don't blame us. We said, if you're gonna incite violence, that's clearly out of bounds. We're gonna kick you off immediately. But we're gonna allow people to go right up to the edge. And we're gonna allow other people to respond. We had to set up some ground rules, basic decency, no nudity and no violent or hateful speech. And after that, we felt some reluctance to interpose our value system on this worldwide community that was growing. And of course, the Trump campaign and likely the Clinton campaign used Facebook in this new age marketing environment. What was Facebook's role in aiding marketers on how to use this platform? I'm going to spend $100 million on your platform. Send me a manual. They say, we don't have a manual. I say, well, send me a human manual then. I spent $100 million on a platform, the most in history. It made sense for them to be there to help us make sure how we spent it right. So this brings us to the question of weaponization. There are many governments who spend upwards of $100 billion annually on military, China and Russia both included. Additionally, given the different economic systems, what risks exist by having servers running through these countries? There are also many terrorist organizations and nation states. These aren't just bad actors, they are organized with the intention to destroy entire countries. Facebook has a population greater than China and India combined with an operating income of $24 billion in 2017. Can its business model provide adequate resources to protect its citizens while satisfying shareholders' demands? If yes, why haven't they done so until now? If no, what lies ahead? Disruption and innovation happens across all industries and walks of life. Even war can be disrupted. Professor Christensen explains his visit to the Pentagon where he briefed 40 of the highest ranking officials in the Department of Defense of the United States during the Clinton administration. Uh, General Shelton, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs at the time, put his hand up and he said, Clay, you're clueless about why we're interested in this stuff. And I said, I am clueless. And he said, well, let me explain. And he went up to the, the diagram and he said, you know what you say is the most demanding tier of the market as sheet steel in that industry. 
In our industry, he said that's the Russians. They historically have been the most demanding problem that we've had to defend against. And then he described what you call as the integrated steel companies like U.S. Steel. He said, that's us, the U.S. Department of Defense. And everything that we're doing is targeted at helping us contain the war against the Russians. And then he looked at the bottom of the market and he said, the low end of the, of the sheet market, or of the steel market is rebar. For us, that's terrorism. And what you call this the mini mills coming up from the bottom, we call non-nation nations like Al-Qaeda. And he said, there isn't anything about what, how we're organized to pros, pros, execute our mission with the Russians. There isn't anything about it that allows us to succeed in terrorism. And, uh, and then he sat down and all of the hands in the room went up. And for two hours, they were throwing questions at me and they, with each other and arguing against each other around this, what is this disruption happening in our world. And one of the most early questions that was asked was, has there been any instance of a company that was the leader in their industry when they were disrupted by something from the bottom? Is there an instance where the leader stayed as the leader? And I said, there are a few, but in every case, they succeeded by setting up a completely different business unit and giving it a charter to disrupt the parent. And that's the only time when it has happened. Technology by itself is just a tool, just like metals, that can be used for swords and plowshares. It is humanity's responsibility to raise the bar of morality in the world. Artificial intelligence cannot accomplish this without human input. This battle has been raging for thousands of years with humankind. The only thing that has changed is the location of the battlefield.